Dear friends, welcome to the channel The Eastern Front. Today we will talk about a scout of the Soviet Union, an ordinary village guy who became one of the legendary scouts during the war. He was fluent in six dialects of German, primarily Berlin, and also obtained valuable information behind the enemy lines. Nikolai Kuznetsov, while walking in the German rear, uncovered two real sensations. One of them is about Adolf Hitler's secret headquarters near Vinnytsia, where Wolf. He also warned about the preparation of Operation Long Jump, during which Hitler's agents were preparing attempts on the leaders of the Big Three at the Tehran Conference. And this is not a complete list of the merits of Soviet Scout. In this video, I will also tell you about all the liquidated high-ranking German offices, as well as why Nikolai Kuznetsov failed his main task to eliminate the Reich Commissioner of Ukraine, Erich Koch. Thanks to the agent network, the partisans from the Victorious Detachment and special means, the scout Nikolai Kuznetsov held out behind the enemy lines for more than 16 months. Nowadays, any intelligence officers could only envy the technical means that we have now. According to official data, the future scout Nikolai Ivanovich Kuznetsov was born in 1911 in a peasant family in the village of Zaranka, Kamishlovsky district's Perm province. However, it's known that his father, Ivan Pavlovich Kuznetsov, managed to serve military service in the Russian army in the Grenadier Regiment in the St. Petersburg. He had a great desire for his children to get an education. From early childhood, Nikolai showed an aptitude for learning, especially foreign languages. He studied German in Esperanto. He was lucky. Somehow, a foreign language teacher, Nina Nikolaevna Avtokratova, who was educated in Switzerland, got into their village. She knew both German and French perfectly. And the boy was friends with a teacher of labor from former prisoners of war, the Czech Franz Javorek, from whom he learned live speech, army vocabulary, including obscene. In addition, the future scout managed to independently study the Kome Perman language, as well as Polish and Ukrainian. After graduation, his father insists on continuing his studies, and Nikolai goes to study in Tumen. In 1926, 16 years old Nikolai came to Tumen, but he only spent a year here. His father died in 1927 from tuberculosis, after which the eldest son Nikolai took over all the care of the family. But he was not destined to fulfill his father's dream of becoming an agronomist, and his own became a forester. He was a very demanding person, not only to himself, but also to others. Accordingly, not everyone was happy with the conduct of such person. In 1926, in Tumen he was accepted into the Komsomol, and in 1929 he was ignominiously expelled from the college and the Komsomol organization. An anonymous denunciation was written against him, in which it was said that the father exploited the labor of wage workers and peasants. Moreover, his father and Kolchak reached the Krasnoyarsk and fought on the side of the whites. At that time, there was just a policy of fighting such a class of people. He was expelled from the Komsomol without any trial, and on the next day from the college, the document says, excluded as an enemy element. All roads were closed in front of Kuznetsov. He could have had no education, no good position, no profession. Kuznetsov protested, an error has occurred here. You expressed political distrust to me, but you will hear about me again. I will prove that I was treated unfairly. I will prove that I deserve to be called the son of the socialist motherland. Leaving the Komsomol bureau, he said, we will see who is a real patriot among us. This psychological trauma remained with him for the rest of his life. He constantly had to prove that he was better. From Talitsa, Kuznetsov went to the Perm region, Kudimkar, where he left his brother a photocard with the inscription. As you can see, my face involuntarily expresses not only grief, but also a certain confusion before the injustice committed. This mood must be overcome. And indeed, in the photo he looked depressed. Usually, near to the point of pedantry, he didn't notice that the collar of his shirt was crumpled, and his tie was askew. In Kadumkar, Nikolai gets a job as a specialist in accounting for forest resources. He travels all over the district, meets people, conducts explanatory work on collectivization, 
The unification of small individual peasant farms into large collective socialist farms. The locals take him for their own. He quickly learned traditions and culture and even the Koma language and continues to write letters to restoration in the Komsomol. In November 1931, he was reinstated in the Komsomol. However, soon he suffered again because of his truthfulness. Working as a forester in the Koma Permak district, Kuznetsov informed the police about numerous embezzlements by his superiors. But the superiors also managed to frame Nikolai himself. And our hero received a year of probation and was expelled from the Komsomol for the second time. Most likely, it was during this period of his life that Nikolai was recruited and became an agent of the NKVD under the nickname Kulik. At that time, the NKVD was very concerned about the uprising in the Kazim Tundra. When the mutiny ended, Nikolai Kuznetsov found himself in Sverdlovsk. In 1928, construction of the giant plant began in Sverdlovsk. For future production, they buy the most modern imported equipment, and foreigners come to the Ural together with the new machines. Some arrived to install new equipment. Some Czechs and Poles, Greeks, British and Americans came to work at the factory under construction for hire. But most of all, there were Germans, out of 311 specialists, 141 from Germany. The plant was initially focused on the production of not only machines for ferrous metallurgy, but also for the production of artillery. So it's quite understandable that there were scouts among these specialists. Nikolai Ivanovich easily converges with foreign specialists and obtains information of interest to counterintelligence. From the personal file of Nikolai on the Ural Marsh plant, their characteristics are quite strange. Comrade Kuznetsov is ready to enter the service at his first call, participates in public work and so on. At work, working hours are from 8 to 17 hours. Why call a person to work if he already has to go to it? Kuznetsov receives a new call sign, scientist. His knowledge of German is ideal for a new assignment, as is his position. He carries the drawings to the workshops, which allows him to move around the entire territory of the plant and communicate with different people. He stood out sharply from the general background. Soft hat, imported coat, rubber soled shoes. The young agent has recently been described in the characteristics that he is resourceful and quick-witted, has an exceptional ability to make the necessary acquaintances and quickly navigate the situation, and suddenly an arrest. According to Article 58, Paragraph 10, Anti-Soviet Propaganda, he will spend only six months in the internal prison of the NKVD. Apparently, a case was fabricated against Kuznetsov in order for him to help find out who and what their connections and everything else were doing. In 1939, the People's Commissar of the NKVD of the Koma region, Mikhail Ivanovich Jorovlov, recommended Kuznetsov to Leonid Fedorovich Reichmann, head of the 5th Department of the 2nd Secret Political Department of the NKVD of the USSR. While the employee who checked his knowledge of the language on the phone decided that he was talking to opponent from Germany, since he himself worked in this country and he knew the language perfectly. In 1938, a new tenant appeared in the Moscow house number 20 on Karl Marx Street. As soon as Nikolai Kuznetsov disappeared in Sverdlovsk, Rudolf Wilhelmovich Schmidt, a native Saarbrücken, brought to Russia by his parents back in 1914, appeared in Moscow. The call sign colonist, according to legend, is also the test engineer of the aviation plant in the Philly, where the German junkers built their planes until recently. And now Soviet aviation was being created here. How Kuznetsov ended up in Moscow and who gave him protection is unknown. He wasn't destined to become a full-time employee, because an agent with such a background couldn't work officially. It was a difficult time of repressions. Thanks to one great man, Fedotov, who deepened counterintelligence. Despite Kuznetsov's personal file, he decided to use him as a special agent in the German direction. 
Just then, there was very little time left before the war, so Nikolai Kuznetsov became a classified freelance agent of the NKVD. The colonist agent's entry into the spy world of Moscow began rapidly. The smartly dressed man could often be seen in theaters and restaurants. It was hard to imagine a better bait for foreign intelligence agents. Especially when you consider that, according to legend, he worked for a testers at a super-secret aircraft factory. While working in Moscow, the colonists uncovered more than 20 other agents. He recruited a dozen foreign diplomats. The cases of many of them are still classified. With his participation, a safe was opened in the apartment of the German naval attaché, and secret documents were filmed. Kuznetsov was also directly involved in the interception of diplomatic mail. He has a good relationship with the German military attaché in Moscow, Ernst Kirstring, which allowed the special services to set up wiretapping of the diplomat's apartment. On 24 April 1941, the valley of the German ambassador told Kuznetsov that the situation is such that we are parking our backs. War may begin. These words formed an urgent message to the leadership. After the beginning of the war, Kuznetsov rushes to the front and writes one report after another. The endless waiting depressed him terribly. I have the right to demand that I be given the opportunity to benefit my motherland in the fight against the worst enemy. But a more difficult task was being prepared for him. The Battle of Moscow had passed, and Kuznetsov was still waiting and preparing. For Nikolai Kuznetsov, documents are selected from among the papers of Wehrmacht officers who died during the Battle of Moscow, outwardly similar to Kuznetsov. This is how Lieutenant General Paul Zibert appeared, who was soon to go to operational work in western Ukraine. But before sending Nikolai Kuznetsov to the rear of the enemy, he was put in a German prisoner of war camp near Krasnogorsk for several months so that he could replenish his vocabulary with relevant military and trench vocabulary. Learn to freely navigate in details of the relationship between the different branches of the German army, and also to check how well he will play the role of a German officer. Paul Zibert passed this kind of exam without a single mistake, after which he was transferred to the saboteur training base near Moscow. Back in the summer, immediately after the start of the war, a special group under the NKVD was created, under the leadership of Pavel Sudoplatov. In fact, he headed all the reconnaissance and sabotage work in the rear of the German army, and the group was also responsible for organizing a partisan movement behind the enemy lines. So, under the city of Rivna, there is a detachment of winners under the command of Medvedev. The command staff in Moscow understood that a deep check would lead to the failure of the agent. So, they sent Kuznetsov for a short period of time, but he held out for a year and a half. It seems incredible how a man who has never served in the army, who has never been to Germany, will work for so long under the guise of a German officer in Rivne. Kuznetsov successfully moved in army circles, got acquainted with the German officials and officers of the special services. Valuable information was transmitted from him to the center, and Kuznetsov also carried out death sentences against the fascist executioners. So, the Soviet intelligence officer became aware of the preparation of Operation Long Jump, during which headless agents were preparing attempts on the leaders of the Big Three, and also thanks to one of the ambushes arranged for high-ranking officers of the Wehrmacht, it was possible to obtain documents indicating the location of Hitler's bunker on the Eastern Front and the underground communication cable connecting the werewolf bunker with the Berlin. The main task of the Soviet intelligence officer was the elimination of Erich Koch, the chief executioner of Ukraine in Crimea. This is how the deputy of Adolf Hitler was rightfully called, on the territory from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Reich Commissioner of Ukraine Erich Koch, on whose hands is the blood of millions of people, including the victims of Babi Yar.
Here are some quotes from this figure of Nazi Germany. I need a Pole to kill a Ukrainian when meeting a Ukrainian, and on the contrary, for a Ukrainian to kill a Pole. And if they shoot a Jew on the way, it will be just what I need. Some people are extremely naive about Germanization. They think we need Russians, Ukrainians and Poles, whom we would force to speak German. We don't need Russians, Ukrainians or Poles. We need their lands. Koch was terrified of death and surrounded himself with the numerous guards, fearing assassination attempts. For this reason, he chose for his residence the provincial town of Rivne, closer to the western border of Ukraine. The partisan detachment developed several plans to assassinate the Reichskommissar. The first one was planned to raid the Koch residence by a group of 23 fighters, disguised in German military uniforms under the command of Paul Siebert. But it turned out that Koch rarely happens in Rivne. The second one provided for the liquidation of Koch together with the top of the Nazi command on 20 April 1943. On this day he was scheduled to speak at a large rally on the occasion of Hitler's birthday. Under the command of Kuznetsov, the fighters had to throw grenades at the podium and then hide. Everything was prepared, but Koch was not in exactly that day. Then the third option appeared, the audacious murder of the race commissar in his office. Soon there was a reason to get to the reception. In the 43rd, Valentina Dovge appears in the squad of winners. Her father was brutally executed by Banderas bastards and she dreamed of revenge. She was given fake documents by the Volksdeutsche, the so-called ethnic Germans living outside Germany. She was brought to Rivne, and soon a dark-haired girl began to be met in the company of a German officer, Paul Siebert. It was then that the idea was born to get an audience with the Koch under the pretext of wanting to get a marriage license with a Ukrainian girl of a German origin. At the same time, Kuznetsov met a German dog handler named Schmidt, who trains dogs to guard Koch and the scout decided to take advantage of a new friend from a radio message to the center, 20 May 1943. The colonists had a meeting with the German Chief Corporal Schmidt, a trainer of a sniffer dogs. Within 10 days, Schmidt must be near Koch in order to accustom the dog to him. The colonist has become closer to the trainer. The dog gets used to the colonist, already takes food from his hands. At first, through a shepherd dog trainer to protect Koch, he reached out to Koch's adjutant and endeared him to himself. And the adjutant arranged a meeting for him. In the summer of 1942, Paul Siebert entered the residence of the race commissar of Rivne. On the day of the appointment with Koch, everything immediately went wrong. Siebert and his fiance were called to the office in turn. Initially, not the way they expected to go together. There was a shepherd dog sitting at a Koch's table, but not at all the one that Kuznetsov was feeding and training. Several guards and the dog didn't take their eyes off Kuznetsov's hands. There was a chair two or three meters away. One of the guards said, please sit down and that's it. The dog is carefully trained. Kuznetsov tried to get the documents, and the dog immediately appeared at his feet and began to grin. It became obvious that there was no way to kill Koch. Kuznetsov failed to complete the main task from the colonist report to the center. I saw Koch and in front of him two guards who sat down between me and Koch. The third was standing behind me. There is a black dog behind the chair. The conversation lasted about 30-40 minutes. All the time the guards looked at my hands as if fascinated. Koch didn't give me his hand. Greeting from afar by raising his hand. The distance was about 5 meters between me and Koch. Two people were sitting and another one was behind my chair. Therefore, there was no way to put your hand in your pocket. I was in a summer uniform and there was no grenade with me. Failure to fulfill a combat mission during the war is a tribunal. The squad asked Moscow's reaction, indicating that something the colonist doesn't succeed. Either he is a strong coward or he has cheated. We should check it out. This message was sent to Sudoplatov, the head of the detachment in Moscow. Kuznetsov's explanations were accepted and he continued his walk. But on the other hand, his comrades began to doubt him. 
Not all of his comrades were able to understand why Kuznetsov didn't complete the task. Suspicion of cowardice was expressed in his face, which of course hurt Nikolai Ivanovich very much. Perhaps that's why all his further activities are like an action movie. In order to prove that he was not a coward, he began to kill all the high figures of fascist Germany in Ukraine who came to hand. The first person eliminated by Nikolai Kuznetsov was Koch deputy Paul Dagel. Every day at 1 o'clock, Paul Dagel returned home from work for lunch. The Soviet intelligence officer decided to take advantage of Dagel's pedantry and made an attempt on him right on the street in the middle of the day. However, it turned out that he didn't destroy Dagger, but the chief head of finance at the Reich's Commissariat, the imperial advisor Hans Gell, who came from Berlin, and his adjutant. However, the task of killing Dagel was not completed, and Kuznetsov couldn't allow the same mistake as with Koch. A month after the murder of Hans Gell, Kuznetsov's grenade will overtake Dagel. During the assassination attempt, Nikolai himself almost died. He was wounded by a shrapnel. However, Dagel was seriously injured and subsequently lost both legs and was evacuated to Berlin. After the daring attack in the center of Rivne, Gestapo chief Müller sent a directive to Ukraine, take the scout alive. The scout's next target was Major General Max Ilgen, commander of the so-called Eastern Special Forces. He was responsible for protecting the rear and suppressing the partisan movement. Ilgen had to be captured alive. The mansion occupied by Ilgen in Rivne was surrounded by high fence with barbed wire and guarded by three sentries, by Lydia Lisowska, a former Polish ballerina who collaborated with the Soviet intelligence. She worked in the house as a maid. Lisowska secretly let Nikolai and several other scouts into the house. Ilgin returned in the evening. He was captured without attracting attention and taken out. But along the way, it was decided to interrogate Ilgin and liquidate him. The next target of Kuznetsov, the president of the Supreme Court of Western Ukraine, SS Oberführer Alfred Funk, the main task of which was to destroy in a legalized form the population of the race commissariat of Ukraine. It was probably the most desperate operation. It was decided to hold it right in the courthouse. In the morning, entering the courthouse, Kuznetsov killed Alfred Funk with three shots in his office. It was too audacious an attack. Himmler takes a personal control of the situation in Rivne, and a special purpose detachment arrived in the city, whose main goal is to eliminate the Soviet agent. In January 1944, the Rivne Lutz operation began. The Germans hurriedly transferred their headquarters to Lviv. It was decided to transfer the scout to Lviv too. In 1944, Kuznetsov was assigned to arrive in Lviv and destroy the governor of Galicia. When he went to the place, the governor was absent due to illness. Then our intelligent officer killed his deputy, who was in charge of the Galicia district government, Otto Bauer, and the chief of the chancellery, Heinrich Schneider. Nikolai already had a guess that Paul Zibert had already begun to arouse the certain suspicions. And now it was not possible to stay in Lviv. Kuznetsov's group broke out of the city with a fight. For two weeks Kuznetsov and several comrades have been walking in the easterly direction to their own troops. At that time, the city of Lutsk was liberated. Exactly 140 kilometers were literally till the front. On the night of March 8, 1944, they approached the Barakina village and asked to eat and spend the night. And suddenly, at this time, the Bandera gang broke in. Nikolai Kuznetsov blew himself up with a grenade. How and where Kuznetsov died with accuracy could be restored only 20 years after the end of the war. They learned about the death of the scout from intercepted German reports. They reported that Paul Zibert was killed. In the autumn, an order appeared in the newspaper to assign the title of hero of the Soviet Union among lieutenants, majors, sergeants, and last row, simply without rank and position, was Nikolai Kuznetsov. Nikolai Kuznetsov was sent to the partisan detachment in August of the 42nd. He will remember both the exact day and the exact hours and write about it in his farewell letter before going on a mission to eliminate Koch.
Tomorrow marks the 11th month of my stay behind the enemy lines. On 25th August 1942, at 24 hours and 5 minutes, I descended from the sky by parachute to take merciless revenge for the blood and tears of our mothers and brothers, groaning under the yoke of the German occupiers. I love life, I'm still young, but if it's necessary to sacrifice my life for the motherland that I love as my own mother, I will do it. Let the fascists know what a Russian patriot and Bolshevik is capable of. Let them know that it's impossible to conquer our people, as it's impossible to extinguish the sun. Let you die, but in the sound of the brave and strong in spirit, you will always be a living example, a proud call to freedom to delight. This is my favorite work of writer Maxim Gorky. Let our youth read it more often and let me die. Because I know that patriots are immortal in the memory of my people. Yor Kuznetsov The main goal of the scout Erich Koch still survived. When the Red Army entered the territory of East Prussia, the Reich's commissar demanded to stand to the death, to fight for every inch of his native land. He put all people under the gun. As soon as the opportunity presented itself, he fled from the doomed province, at the same time organizing plastic surgery for himself. After correcting his physiognomy, Koch turned into a modest agricultural worker. He lived quietly in the town of Hasenmoor. Despite the plastic surgery, in 1949 he was identified and exposed. Then there was a trial and a death sentence. However, the sentence was not executed and the death penalty was replaced with the life imprisonment due to the poor health of the convict. However, in prison in the Polish city of Barcu, the terminally ill Koch lived for almost 30 years afterwards. Dear friends, that's all for today. I wish you peace and health. See you.